now I'd like to invite David Minty uh, to come down to move us up to 2022, <laughs> uh, faster than the speed of light. And we are very grateful that he could be with us here today um, to uh, first go for the presentation of the award with the certificate, a picture of Sir Richard Maine, uh, the Cambridge alum who helped to contribute to the Pelian principles and a uh, representation of this award, uh, which I promise not to drop this time, uh, with, with no discrimination against Australians. Well, perfect. Thank you. And we now invite you to deliver the Sir Richard Main Award for 2022. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dave Minty, and I'm currently the Temporary Assistant Chief Constable of Wiltshire Police, and I'm here this afternoon to take you through my thesis. My thesis was titled, What Should Police Agencies Do When Faced with an Unprecedented Incident? And Can the 2018 Salisbury Poisonings and Taleb's Theories of Black Swan Events and Anti-Fragility Be Used to Prepare for Future Unprecedented Events? It's a really catchy title. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why this title? On the March 4th, 2018, the nerve agent Novichok was placed on the door handle of a house in Salisbury belonging to a male by the name of Sergei Skripal. What happened next has been subject to huge public scrutiny, several documentaries, and a drama in which my character had a beard, something I've been trying to grow since the age of 14, and I just have struggled. Um, my role at the time was as head of force operations, and I chaired the first multi-agency meeting on the morning of the 5th of March. I became the chair of the tactical coordinating group that day and remained in place throughout response and into recovery. I remained the chair of the TCG for a year and up until the point at which Salisbury was declared safe. I felt I knew this subject well, and I knew about the impact on local policing. Just to be clear, that's not the sexy stuff, chasing Russians across the world. I know there are colleagues both in this room and, and online that did that. I did the more, rather more mundane, but I believe critical impact on an entirely unexpected event on a small cathedral city and its community. I wanted to look at this subject that I had become intrinsically linked with and apply some academic rigour to look at how my experiences could potentially help policing moving forward. So in order to do that, I needed a structure. The writings of Nassim Nicholas Taleb were new to me and I was introduced to them by Professor Sherman. There were two important concepts created by Taleb that I felt could help me look at the 2018 Salisbury poisonings in a way that might benefit policing. The first is his concept of a black swan event, and the second, the idea of anti-fragility. Taleb describes a black swan event as, first, it is an outlier, as it lies outside the realm of regular expectations, because nothing in the past can convincingly point to its possibility. Second, it carries an extreme impact, and third, in spite of its outlier status, human nature makes us concoct explanations for its occurrence after the fact, making it explainable and predictable. Taleb chose the name Black Swan, as before the discovery of Australia, it was believed that all swans were white, and it demonstrates how, in his words, one single observation can invalidate a general statement derived from millennia of confirmatory sightings. The second of Taleb's concepts is that of anti-fragility. In his book, Anti-Fragile, Taleb argues that the opposite of fragile is not robust. It is anti-fragile. He goes on to say that anti-fragility is beyond resilience or robustness. The resilient resists shocks and stays the same. Anti-fragile gets better. So returning to the aim of my thesis and the main title question, I wanted to understand how we as a policing agency were able to respond to a black swan event and assess whether that response was anti-fragile. Did we get stronger and better because of it? And to do this, I used my experience during the 2018 Salisbury poisonings. So the methodology. This was clearly a qualitative study. Alongside a detailed literature review, I was really lucky to have worked with four exceptional individuals throughout the response to the poisonings. My interviewees included the head of public health, the regional lead for health protection, the senior scientific advisor to Port and Down, and um, oh, head of CBR at Port and Down, and the Wiltshire Police DCC, who chaired the strategic coordinating group. All four of those individuals have PhDs, and three of them are professors, which makes writing your master's theses either intimidating or easy. I'm not sure which yet. Um, alongside these interviews and their personal recollections, I also had access to records and minutes, and I'm also grateful to the support I got from ACCO in Wetherill, from MPOC and CT Policing, who assisted me with how we approach training and threat assessment. 
it's fully accepted that this study was limited. It was limited by the fact that it is a single event and not one that can be replicated. Although I interviewed the key decision makers in response to the incident, there are only four people. And finally, working as I did on the local response, although the relationship with CT policing was superb throughout, for obvious reasons, I did not have access to all the information surrounding the incident. To answer my main thesis question, I used four individual research questions. The first asked whether the Salisbury poisonings were indeed a black swan. You'll remember from the definition that a black swan is defined as an outlier as it lies outside the realm of regular expectations. The key part of the definition, however, is that nothing in the past can convincingly point to its possibility. Clearly, in the UK, we had previously had the poisoning of Alexander Litvinenko. Did this event point to the Salisbury poisonings being a possibility? I personally believe that the Salisbury poisonings were a black swan, but it is important that perspective is considered. It is possible that for some that attack in Salisbury was not a black swan and there was some level of expectation, but for the people of Salisbury and the emergency services it was, in my opinion, a black swan. The individuals I interviewed agreed with the assessment, as you can see, by the two top quotes. However, there was one notable exception who felt the attack itself was not a black swan. They based this on the previous Litvinenko attack, although they recognised that the ingredients at this incident were very novel. The second part of the research question related to what organisations and ecosystems were in place to respond to the event and were tested for their resilience. In Wiltshire, we had and still have a very mature local partnership under the Local Resilience Forum. It was this structure, as defined through the Civil Contingencies Act, that became the ecosystem that was used to respond to the Salisbury poisonings. This following slide demonstrates how the local ecosystem that I've just shown you linked into the wider national ecosystem. Of note is the HERC, or the Health Emergency Response Cell. This was new a new structure created in response to the Salisbury poisonings, although I understand it had been discussed previously. Its role was to operate in the science and health space between the Local Scientific and Technical Advisory Cell, or STAC, and the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, or SAGE, which sits at the national level. The second research question involved identifying the key events as described by those involved in the response and how the strategies that were put in place evolved across a cooperative network of people and organisations. The first thing of note was that the participants did not identify the same events that you may expect having watched the news footage. For the participants, it was not the outcomes of events, but the processes and the functional systems that were put in place. So the first key decision was the creation of the LRF structures. This seems obvious, it is in effect mandated by the Civil Contingencies Act, but for the participants this gave them the structure in which to operate. It was a structure in which they were comfortable, and as the chair of the SCG put it, it allowed us to deal with the abnormal in the normal way. The second key decision was the location of the cordons that were put in place. Although in the main these were the normal criminal cordons that police put in place, they also became the public health cordons. We had to be able to say that outside those cordons, everything was safe. The location of the cordons influenced everything the local community, uh, everything for the local community, and the cordons remained in place until we were able to say categorically they were safe. The third key event was not an event per se, but it was that when the processes around the sharing of event intelligence became smooth, robust, and consistent. This was a new substance, Novichok, and it was critical that the supply of information and intelligence across both the investigation and the response worked well. This took some time to evolve, but once it did, it allowed for the response to the incident to become much more joined up. The creation of the HERC, or the Health Emergency Cell, Response Cell, as I described earlier, was the final key decision highlighted by all. It demonstrates how the ecosystems were able to evolve during the incident. It did not appear to have any terms of reference, and at, the, at it, its inception, it felt clunky and difficult. However, as one interviewee put, st said, it started off as quite an unhelpful entity, and I think went through an evolution to the point why, at the end, where it was actually, I think, reasonably sensible to have it. My third research question, and don't worry, there are only four, I promise. Uh, my third research question is quite simply, did we succeed? How is that measured? And importantly, and bringing it back to my main thesis question, can it be considered anti-fragile? So in answer to the first part of the question, did the ecosystem that was in place succeed? The overwhelming consensus was yes. This is clearly subjective and must not, it must not be forgotten that an individual lost their life. But overall, the participants in the study felt that it was a success. Measuring this is somewhat more problematic. As was pointed out by one respondent, there is no real comparator. 
They went on to point out that it's difficult to prove that mitigation, uh, prove, but that mitigation and a swift collaborative response did prevent escalation and harm. This lack of escalation was identified by all people I spoke to. There were five people directly affected by the nerve agent and all had direct contact with the primary source. There does not appear to have been any apparent victims of cross-contamination or transference of the substance. Another way of assessing whether the response was successful was that it met the strategic aim set by the strategic commander. This is a very cold way of assessing success, but probably the most effective and measurable. In response to the key question of whether our approach was anti-fragile, the answer from all respondents was no. The ecosystem worked well. It can be considered a success, but it is not thought that it got stronger. The success was based on using the structures already in place and the driving force were the personalities involved. Relationships improved and to some extent it could be argued some anti-fragility was built into the system. You'll remember that the Salisbury poisonings was in fact two events and it could be argued that the response to the second was significantly smoother than the first and the response was probably better for it. However, with the passing of time, the participants in the study all agreed that the structures had not got stronger because of the Salisbury poisonings and therefore could not be considered anti-fragile. The final research question deals with how we can become more anti-fragile. How can the learning we have from Salisbury inform policing and other ecosystems that may need to deal with the future black swans? Taleb listed four strategies for becoming anti-fragile. The first is hormesis. Is the idea that, this is the idea that a small dose of a harm, harmful substance can do you good. It is often used in medicine and the basis for some vaccines where a small dose is introduced to which the immune system adapts and becomes stronger. It could be argued that we are quite good at this in policing. We have our daily emergency response which we are unable to predict but that we slowly adapt to, ensuring our response becomes more efficient. All the agencies that were involved in the Salisbury poisonings have similar response, responsibilities and the structures that were in place have developed over time to meet the needs of this service when dealing with incidents. Hormesis can be considered a viable way of preparing for future incidents. However, it cannot be manufactured and relies on events happening. With the Black Swan event, there is no predictability, so no way of ensuring the right areas of your response have developed. The next strategy is that of redundancy. This is the idea of having extra capacity in a system that can help deal with a black swan. Taleb himself points to nature to show how this works in practice. Humans having two kidneys is a good example. The ability to survive is only dependent on one, but the capability is there should an emergency happen. The idea of redundancy is clearly advantageous, but I doubt it would work in policing. I'm sure that most chiefs would love to recruit a significant number of staff just in case, but it would probably not be seen as an efficient use of their budget. Taleb goes on to describe a bimodal approach to becoming anti-fragile. This is where there are two approaches. One approach is about extreme risk aversion and protection, whilst at the same time the second approach is about taking lots of small risks. The best example of this would be in an investing, where an individual investor, clearly not a police officer, invests most of their capital in very safe investments that will weather any shocks, whilst at the same time investing a small amount in high-risk options, thus allowing them the opportunity for extreme success whilst insulated from failure. It could be argued that there are some areas of a, um, that a bimodal approach is taken in policing, our approach to counter-terrorism, for example. However, it could work best in, conjun in conjunction with the next strategy. Taleb discusses small-scale experimentation as the final way of becoming anti-fragile. Policing does this well. We regularly exercise our capabilities and in numerous different ways. It is an area of strength and one that we should continue. In conclusion, we need to consider how we reduce the number of black sons we may face in the future. Does our small-scale experimentation or exercising prepare us for a black swan? It might if we link it to a bimodal approach. Currently, all of our training is based on what is already known. We look back to look forward. This makes sense, particularly in the world of policing where you may often get copycat crimes. It also makes sense when it comes to funding exercises. It is much easier to get funding to train against a known threat and not a threat that may never materialise. The National Risk Register, or NRR, is used to identify the likely risks that will be faced. However, there is no scope within the NRR to identify black swans. The NRR focuses on reasonable worst-case scenarios and actively removes highly unlikely variations. This does not allow for black swans in any shape or form. As such, I believe that this is an area that we can improve. We have experts in all areas of emergency planning and response. There should be scope to utilise their expertise and imagination to consider worst-case scenarios. 
Not worst case scenarios within parameters of being likely, but worst case scenarios that are entirely unlikely. If this is looked at through the bimodal strategy, policing and partners should remain heavily invested in dealing with the most likely threats. This makes sense, but there should be a small amount of investment in trying to identify the next black swan.